This was the first of the long journeys that I did by canoe. This one in 1946, right at the end of the war. Here I and my brother are discussing the story afterwards. Nothing like maps to know exactly where you went. Callum Gillies was a man of sky. He had three languages, Gaelic, German, which is where he went to university, and English as a sort of afterthought third. All the canoes were of the folding variety, and most of the trip it rained. The people of the village of Tenalt had instituted a Kaili to greet their soldiers back from the war, and we were invited to join them. It went on all night and was an absolute wonderful party. I asked Callum to write a letter to me about describing these various things, so here they are. It sounds appalling, but in fact it was one of the most glorious moments that I can remember anywhere in the canoeing world is starting off at dawn. As the dawn comes in and the birds start to sing, something absolutely marvellous. Loch Etif, a little island near the estuary, the mouth of the loch with Loch Linney, where birds nested abundantly. And when we came round, some of them went up into the air, others just stayed put on their nests. Little common gull trying to get out of its shell, the little Ducks, I shouldn't have put my hand there. I didn't know any better in those days. And certainly I shouldn't have picked them up like that. I should have left them alone. Certainly you can pass through and the birds will ignore you. Or they'll bomb you, perhaps, but that's all. Here they are fishing, wonderful. No Megansa here, but plenty later on. And Ida Duck. And finally, of course, the best of the lot. See how much notice they take? They just watch and are careful. Falls of Laura are a tidal rapid, if you like, under Connell Bridge. And naturally, you go the way the water is flowing. So here on the ebb, at, by the look of it, the neap tides, because on springs it gets very rough indeed, and we charge through, getting the fast current to help us. I did it on springs because I had been up there a week before at Connell Ferry, and certainly it was very difficult then, or I thought so at that time. And here we join the bigger loch of Loch Linney with the Oban to the south and the Appin Rock, which is a plug, a volcanic plug of granite, which was pushed up out of the land when the whole area was in a volcanic condition. Dog tired, you remember? We hadn't had any sleep that previous night. And here we all are, quite worn out, and having a rest in the canoe before coming ashore to prepare our camp. See the tidal limits here, which goes right up to Fort William, of course, and is still tidal.
a reasonable start, and then down came the weather. Fortunately, the tide was with us, and the wind was with us, so we floated on up Loch Linne, past Ballahulish and all its haunted history. The tide and the wind, of course, were running up the channel, and this left the sea flat. It was just as well neither of them were running in the opposite direction because it would have made the water very rough. And at the Narrows at Colin, we come to the lighthouse where we can camp just outside before going on up the rest of Loch Linney. Fast rip through the Narrows at Colin, but then it becomes still tidal. Sometimes it merely was overcast and dull, but it certainly rained. And that is Callum Gillies, the leader of our expedition, who made all the arrangements all the way up. And so to Fort William and the inevitable small boy, don't they always turn up when you have canoes? All these canoes were folding canoes. Did I say it earlier? I think I did. Not to worry. And the shops at Fort William, and then camp at Cochus, which is at the beginning of the Caledonian Canal. Ben Nevis in the background, and we decided we'd take a day off and climb up. Raining still or fine rain most of the time until we got to the top when we disappeared into the clouds and then really it came down and we were soaking wet coming down. On the way down we met a couple of Scots, man and a girl. They said showery and we wondered what on earth would happen if they said rainy because it really was a wet day. Our camp at Corpus. Still raining. Put the camera out of focus, apparently. Not to worry. And now the Caledonian Canal. Now let's see whom we can recognise. Elizabeth Usherwood in the foreground there. And the other side, the ball. Oh, that huge ship is merely an RAF rescue launch, no more. Looks like that when you're down in a little canoe beside it. Difficult getting afloat past a lock or what have you, because of course these canvas covered canoes could not be rushed down over the rocks, merely drill holes in them, which is definitely, we had to miss all that kind of thing out. And now we're in Loch Al Lochy. Friends get kindly and friendly up there cooking some fish which were given us. Noel McNaught there putting a fish on the hub. He was a lone canoeist. He wrote a good many books, didn't he? He lost his life finally canoeing all by himself round the south coast of the peninsula in South Wales. This is into the little loch of Loch Oich and some dwelling there and an old castle. Inver means a river mouth and Castle Gary, at the mouth of the River Gary. And then on, down the ladder of locks, much more easily done on the towpath, if you like, by the canal, by putting your canoe on wheels and trundling them down, and so into Loch Ness at last, and away. The Morriston River was quite a little torrent and we enjoyed, for the first time in my life, playing about in the white water, wild water, at the bottom of the rapids. It was great fun. And what is canoeing about but fun? We thought we were being terrifically brave in those days. This is a little side stream, isn't it beautiful? A bit of sun for a change here. This is where the Loch Ness Monster is supposed to appear at intervals. I've never met anybody who actually has seen it, 
but it's a good legend. It certainly adds to the tourist trade. That's Noel McNaught and his girlfriend with his wheels on the back of the canoe. It's one way of coping with the situation. And a rather difficult landing with an onshore wind, which didn't make it either easy to land or to take off again. Caleb Gillies and Elizabeth ploughing on ahead. And back to another thrill in the canoeing world, shooting weirs. We thought we were going to get the bottoms of our canoes scraped away here, but it was lucky there was enough water. We were all right. I don't know what happened with Callum. He got a bit skew with. It's a very tricky position. Elwyn made a mistake and came down backwards. I don't know what he did. Of course, in those days, we had to carry everything by canoe. All our food, there was still a bit of rationing, I think, as far as I remember. Uh, all our food and all our clothing for the whole fortnight on the water. There's Noel McNaught again. You see the wheels on the back of the canoe and half his load there as well. Me and my companion shooting the weir. Left it to him to paddle. Elwyn doing marvellously, so I got him to do it again, much to his fury. Now, with plenty of time in hand, we just drift on down to Inverness. This will give you some idea of what a canoe can carry. If you look beside my canoe, it was estimated that I was carrying a quarter of a ton of stuff in my canoe taking them all to bits, packing them up, putting them in their cases, dumping them on a lorry to go on down to the railway station. 1946. And here is what Callum in his beautiful English wrote about this marvellous trip. Having told my brother all about it, I then was left with just my own thoughts. And as I did so, I thought of that wonderful poem by Sir Walter Scott. <laughs> 